Super, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm one of uh, four archaeologists, the two others just, just loitering, coming in now, two of the others. Um, work, work, who work with, with the military, with the Ministry of Defence. And that might surprise you that um, we have archaeologists that work with the MOD, and that's because we own so much land, 1% 1, 1 of the UK mainland, so that's a lot of archaeology. So that's why we've got archaeologists. Um, I wasn't the first. Mr Barnes, lurking at the back, um, now Head of Archaeology at National Trust, was the first of these uh, fools that started to work with the military. Um, and I found that uh, working when we're talking about communities, this is a very specific community. Hopefully none of your community groups are armed, <laughs> you work with, but um, ours have been, certainly at, time, at times in their life. Um, and they have their own particular narrative, the military. Um, I always think of it as a bit like doing anthropology, because these people have um, a language, not always polite, but they have a language, they have customs, traditions, costumes, all things that anthropologists would recognise. So working with the military um, is very much like... Um, doing anthropology and it's a very specific and very tight and cohesive community. Um, you can be very much outside the community as a civilian and working with them to be accepted. You know, sometimes it takes some effort, but it is, it's very much worth putting it in. And they have a particular take and a particular interest on certain sorts of heritage and archaeology. And they can bring something, uh, I think, very, very valuable to it as well. Um, when I put the talk together, Paul was very gentle with me. I put in the, the abstract, I came up with an idea, but I didn't come up with a title. <laughs> so um, I was reminded that I needed to put a title in. So this is Paul's title, but it works really well. It works really well, the bootsteps. And I, if you've seen the film All Quiet on the Western Front, there's an ide fix that runs through that about boots. Boots are really important to the military, partly because they, um, you know, an army doesn't march on its stomach, it marches on its boots. And if you haven't got good footwear, that's a really um, tough thing. I, I, Bear in mind, there's a, an excavation that happened in Vilnius about 15 years ago, where they found the remains of some of the retreating soldiers from uh, 1812 from Napoleon's army, and they found a lot of hack marks on the lower limbs of the skeletons, and that's because uh, people had been hacking off the boots of the deceased because walking back from Moscow to France, it's a long way, so boots tended to wear out. So those were valuable items. So boots recur throughout my talk, so it was a very well-chosen time for, thank you. Um, and the, the ones you see here, um, upside down, on an excavation, um, this is an excavation in Belgium, this is one at Ypres, those that know it, a um, very famous First World War battlefield site, a place called New Irish Farm. New Irish Farm was a British cemetery in the First World War, it was cleared, uh, and then the Belgians wanted to put a car park there, um, and a few of us went over to make sure that it had been cleared, and the bodies had been taken away to the, the, the more formalised cemetery, and they had been to an extent, but only to an extent. So you are finding things like that upside down. Um, in those boots were the feet. <coughs> so that's a very peculiar narrative. And to the community that I work with, the military people, that's a member of their tribe. And the military people uh, that I've worked with, and I'm sure many of you will probably work with, have been to some pretty interesting historical places in recent decades. Um, if you think um, Afghanistan, um, they come into Bagram Airfield. Bagram, absolutely solid with archaeology. Uh, Uruk, the picture behind us in Iraq, or Ur, um, cradle of civilization. Even the, the, the speech um, made by uh, Tim Collins at the start of the invasion, heritage was very heavy um, in his delivery to the British military on the eve of battle. And the landscapes on which these individuals train is, of course, filled with heritage and history and archaeology as well. Um, you have the hill fort of Battlesbury, um, which we'll come to a little bit later on, on Salisbury Plain, biggest on Salisbury Plain, lovely by the hill fort, not dissimilar to Maiden in some ways. Um, Cochidius, that we had the privilege of seeing um, last week, on um, Otterburn, the, the statue, the carving to the uh, Romano-Celtic war god, um, holding up his shield. So it's a lot of <coughs> military references. Uh, Chew Green, practice Roman marching camps. Um, so this military training is nothing new on our estate. They've been doing it for the best part of 2,000 years. Um, not always willingly, um, and then an Anglo-Saxon spear. So you're getting these references to military, uh, military history and heritage and archaeology on our estates, but surprisingly little access for those that are walking over it every single day of their, their working lives. And when I say community, and the military community, it's not just necessarily the boots on the ground, it's those families that march with them, because especially the infantry and the, the, the army units, 
they're rotating around um, different places every three years or so. And that's as a community, you are lifted up, moved along, new school. I think that must be really tough as a military child to have to do that. And heritage is one way you can develop a sense of place, a sense of belonging. Um, and archaeology is a really important tool in doing that. So getting the kids involved will enthuse the adults as well. So this is a, a bit of field work we did under the lottery fund. This is Digging War Horse with uh, Julian Richards, I'm sure you'll recognise, pointing out the merits of Flint to a, a very engaged audience, I think you can see. But they did love finding things. So for them, finding um, a bit of willow pattern pottery or a naffy china cup or uh, a fired bullet was really exciting. Um, you know, for the more jaundiced archaeologists, that's the modern stuff you machine off. Um, but you shouldn't, because it's really engaging for these, these people. And uh, as heritage curators on, on the MOD estate, um, I know that uh, the four of us that work on the MOD estate find the military heritage a really good method of access into persuading the military of the importance of archaeology and heritage. I think for the most part they do get it, but if you can tell them about their tribe, and their regimental narrative and things like that, then it's a much easier way of selling the maybe the more um, more uh, subtle prehistory or Romano-British elements. This is a case in point. This is just next to um, a Roman site called Church Pit on Salisbury Plain, big Roman village, marked as an important fragile site on every single military training map, so they shouldn't be going into it. And they may or may not be interested in it, possibly. Very close to it is a little wood block. The wood block is called uh, Down Barn Plantation. It was uh, a set of beech trees. It's been there for it's been there since the uh, mid 19th century, and it was a place where the Australians wasted a bit of their time prior to training for the Battle of Messines in 1917. Um, those of you that have worked with the military know that bored soldier is a very dangerous thing. There are things that the military will always do. I'm not going into all of them, but graffiti is one of them. Absolutely guaranteed. Board soldier, they will write their names. And it's always happened. Hadrian's Wall, uh, pyramids in Egypt, um, going to, a, I don't know, um, up, up into Orkney, going to Maze House, you Viking runic graffiti. It's always going to happen. And trees do not escape either. This tree block at uh, Downbarn Plantation has various bits of things carved into it. And it's a military moniker. This is something that is their heritage. And it can be quite interesting and quite powerful. So, AT, VIC, 10, AIF. Orbost. And I don't know how you did this before the internet, but if you put Orbost into <coughs> Google, you get Victoria in Australia. So, place in Vic Victoria, Orbost, 10 AIF. Um, that's, I thought, the 10th Battalion of the Australian Imperial Forces. The Australian military records are all online. It's an astonishing resource. We don't get that with the British because they were bombed in the in Second, World, in Second World War. But the 10th Battalion, I thought, was a good starting point. So it's looking for someone with the initials AT from Victoria on the 10th, area, 10th Battalion. And there was nobody. Luckily, and I know my wife will back this up, um, I don't have a life. So I had the time to look through all the 10th Brigade names. That's an awful lot of soldiers to try and find if there was anyone. And eventually, I found someone um, from Orbost in Victoria in the 38th Battalion Australian Infantry, 3rd Australian Division, um, and his name was Alexander Todd, AT. So, in 1916, just before he's going out to deploy to the Western Front, he's carving his name, and that's a very, very poignant thing. You can put yourself, not in the bootsteps of, but in the handsteps of someone who served and fought in the Great War. And worse than that, or more interesting than that, you can get his narrative online. Um, this is an attestation paper that he got for winning the military medal in 1918, and let me read it to you. I know you shouldn't read these, but it says, at the beginning of the operations of August the 31st to September the 1st, uh, 1918, near Kaleo Song, Private Todd rushed to within 30 yards of an enemy machine gun position, shot three of the enemy, put the remainder to flight, and capturing the gun. So the man's either a lunatic or incredibly brave. <laughs> so this is the guy that carves his name on the tree. Uh, after that, it says, um, Almost a mile further on, a 77mm gun, that's, that's an artillery piece, was firing point blank at our advancing troops. Todd worked up to the gun, shot five of the crew, thereby silencing the gun and enabling the advance to continue. And it says at the end of it, throughout the advance, this man did excellent work. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the last remaining trace of uh, basically a warhead, a lunatic stroke warhead. Um, 
And, and you can, you, you are standing there with someone who's, you know, you talk to kids about the First World War, this is a guy that experienced it at very, very close proximity. But it doesn't end there because Todd's killed in the last month of the war. He's hit with artillery um, and the letter goes back to his family that he dies of wounds. And that covers a multitude of sins, died of wounds. It can be that he um, is in medical attention, he's in a hospital, looked after by orderlies and crisp linen sheets or dies of multiple open fractures in, a, in a, an artillery bunker when he's been hit, which is what does happen, but you command the media. So that is a tree that's outlived this soldier already by a hundred years. It's a very powerful thing about this military community narrative. They get that. You can tell them about the, the story of this particular soldier. They understand that as heritage and it's only the topmost part of the military palimpsest. And we go from there to a fork and a pipe. Magritte, you're all familiar with, this is not a pipe, this is way more than a pipe um, because there's a narrative and story and we're archaeologists, so we have embedded narratives with artefacts. Um, we've been working on a, on a Bronze Age in the Saxon site of Barra Clump. Um, topmost part of the palimpsest, mustn't machine it off, not least because it's scheduled. Um, taking the topmost part is full of military rubbish, including this fork. Just a standard fork used by soldiers to eat their food, it's a standard knife fork spoon kit. Um, on it, it's got a service number. Military people tend not to share the toothbrush and quite often not the fork. It's one of the few things they don't, don't share. Um, that service number you can trace. The service number links to a gunner moderate who was an air defence gunner in the Second World War, Royal, uh, Royal Artillery. He's deployed to the east, captured at Singapore, taken to an island where the commandant of the island is told, if the Allies are going to liberate your island, you kill all the prisoners. And in 1944, that's exactly what happened to Gunnar Modric. He was executed, body in a mass grave, never been found. His name is on the missing, uh, list of missing on the wall in Singapore. So that is again, much more than a fork. So that's part of the, the topmost palimpsest military narrative, just below it, Anglo-Saxons with spears. But it's the same part of the story. And I know Wessex who are publishing this report are including a military component chapter because it's an important part of the story. Um, and the guys that excavated that site, Barra Clump, many of them were wounded military. The chap on the, on the left um, well, is, a, is a young rifleman, um, partly blinded in, in Afghanistan, so he's out of the military now. He excavated um, this particular 6th century Saxon with a shield boss over the face. Um, and he came up with his own story that he thought there was a series of chaps with shields buried in the ditch of the barrack. He felt they were forming a shield wall to protect the people behind buried elsewhere in the barrow, a bit like he'd been doing a protective line in Afghanistan. And it's a really neat narrative for somebody who's had no formal heritage training or, or education to come up with quite sophisticated interpretations of the site. You may or may not agree, but it's, he's got the confidence to be able to do that. So it's a really nice, neat story. Um, and we also compared military kit um, circa 6th century through to 21st century. Uh, no one was harmed in this operation, I should say. <laughs> but the bloke on the right would have won. <laughs> um, military training, really important, not just to do it for modern deployments, but because the legacy that they've left, having been there for 100 years, is also in its own right becoming archaeology, or is archaeology. Historic England, recent thematic study, a lot of designations we're seeing, seeing on our estate of First World War stuff. It's centenary, obviously, people are very keen on it. This is a sign, site up in... Um, near Dundee, a place called Barry Budden, which uh, Phil and Alex um, led uh, for, for the team, working alongside military veterans. Um, so people are digging trenches willingly on a site where they must have moaned about it incessantly during their training. Um, but nonetheless, they're adding their own stories and, and their own interpretations of a First World War narrative because they've done it for real. And that's something they can really bring to a study of the, the industrial archeology, span if you like, the military ones, because they can interpret it because they've had to look at landscapes and interpret them because their lives have depended upon it. Um, so you've got this observation turret. It's not an Alan Williams turret. I know the chaps would appreciate, if anyone knows what on earth that thing is, it's not Alan at the moment. Um, but the First World War practice site. And we've been able to get some of these guys to go over to the First World War battlefields for real. Um, I'll try to make this as Welsh as possible, this slide. Um, so you've got a dragon, uh, two Welsh soldiers, bottom right, and the Welsh rugby captain for good measure. So we took them over to Mametswood on the Somme, uh, the big 38th division, the Welsh division's battle attack. 
where um, a lot of the team excavated a couple of years ago to see um, why the Welsh had or hadn't succeeded in this wood block and to look at the archaeology there. This is the open ground on the left that the, the Welsh attacked going into the wood block. And one of our um, military guys looked at this and said, I'd have put a sap there, put a machine gun, could basically enfilade far along the whole front line and you'd do an awful lot of damage. That'd be one reason why the Welsh didn't maybe succeed as quickly as they might have done. So we did some geophysics, um, Peter Masters of the Defence Academy, um, and in addition to the, the linear feature you can see running up there, which is a big pipeline, um, there's a little sap popping out from there. That's a little trench coming out from the woods into which the Germans would have put their machine guns. So the reading of the topography and the landscape by this military chap fitted perfectly for what actually happened. In that trench, or just behind it, the front line of the German things, we found the remains of German soldier. Um, you can see his boots, very well preserved. Um, feet were in them, he had his arms there. Um, and that was about all that was left. And the chap that had excavated it had experienced fighting for real. So for him, that was quite a hot jumping moment, but he had been briefed and he was fine. We've excavated also on a site of tanks in the First World War. Two individuals here, one on the left, tank regiment soldier, one on the right, a sniper. And they're excavating the remains of a trap, one of the British tanks knocked out. Below it, two dead German soldiers. And that's their tribe. We didn't leave that soldier, the two skeletal soldiers, overnight because they might have been looted. The military put an armed, well, unarmed, I hope, guard <laughs> round the site to make sure that these bodies were not looted and so that they could be brought back, proper burial, and any chance of identification would be given to them. So that was bringing their community back together again. Best part preserves on this were the boots, German boots. And people have walked along trenches 100 years after they were dug for real. British Trench, Plug Street Wood, near Messines in Belgium, well preserved. Just by it, the remains of an Australian soldier this is his funeral, man with his family in attendance, and his nephew by the gravestone because we were able to identify him. Found initially by his boots. Two boots sticking up, you don't get one boot on its, uh, on its own, you get two and that's almost certainly you're gonna get a body. So you report to the police, report to the, um, the local authority as well, and the, and the military, and then we've excavated him, and that is the chap there. I'm on James May, the 33rd Australian Battalion of Infantry. I can't tell you how much pleasure it's given me to put that picture up. <laughs> Second World War, also important for those that you have lived in a cave every Christmas. Um, this is the Great Escape. Um, we excavated there with uh, Tony Pollard of Glasgow University a few years ago. Um, we excavated in the theatre at Stalagluf III. Um, you've heard of Tom, Dick and Harry, the escape tunnels. There was a fourth, Tunnel George, which was to get into the German area to fight the Germans. Um, very, very brave. And we did all this excavation in the presence of Alfie Fripp. Alfie was the ninth prisoner of war taken in the Second World War when his reconnaissance aircraft was shot down. His pilot shot down with him, Salagov III with him. Um, Mike Casey was one of the great escapers and he was shot by the Gestapo having been captured. He said, I'm glad I came to remember Mike. You reflect back on the memories of the people you know. As for the Germans, I've forgiven them but not forgotten. Well, Alfie played on the stage in theatre. He played in The Merchant of Venice um, there he is in the theatre programme, he and they played the, the, the Jew Shylock as the hero. Didn't go down especially well. <laughs> That's the remains of the, the escape tunnel. You could walk along it still. Um, it was lined with these milk tins for ventilation, Klim tins. And also next to it, we found all manner of stuff, including a radio made out of scraps. So That's the radio being conserved. That's the chap that made it, Frank Stone. And there he is on site with it. We had the chap that made an artifact watching us excavate it. And I said to Frank, how do you feel about us excavating your life as archaeology? And he said, I hated the idea. I hated it. <coughs> but when I've seen it, I've seen the respect, and I've seen that you are remembering us and telling our story through archaeology. So he was a total convert, which was a relief. And we dug crash sites. Here's a Spitfire on Salisbury Plain. It's gone straight down into the chalk. Um, we did it with the... Uh, the, the daughter who'd never met her father who was the pilot because he was killed a month later she was pleased because it was gaining catharsis for some other people through what must have been a horrific experience for her dad and all the finds have gone to his school to be rebuilt in a one-to-one -one spitfire better school than i went to worked with the polish military who also fought in afghanistan to dig one of their airframes a polish hurricane because they said it's the only times you brits ever think positively the poles is the battle of britain 
So we excavated this with Polish military who'd been to Afghanistan and fought with the Brits. Um, right towards the end, we got an image of a guy excavating a skull. You can see skulls tattooed on his arm. And these are all people that were killed in Afghanistan, his mates. He's left a space because he's going to get a tattoo of that, um, one he'd excavated, as a positive change. And just to close, heritage does matter for the military. It really does. Park bench put up onto Battlesbury Iron Age Hill Fort training area. Got scheduled one with clearance just to put a park bench up because <laughs> a few years ago, six guys were killed in a warrior armoured fighting vehicle. Their base was just, just down here. They, this is the bench looking out over where they lived. And in death, their bench has gone up as a place of memorial and respect to their comrades. And you go up there and it's a shrine. If you've been to West Kennet, Longborough, the back chamber filled with um, incense and candles, this is a military equivalent. So it's covered in tins of beer, unopened, wristbands, poems written by the kids of the soldiers that were killed, really emotional. There's the beer. And boots. Thank you very much.